Chinese property shares dropped further on Monday as a housing slump continues and the nation's most indebted developer appears to be struggling with its closely watched restructuring. The industry's outlook turned darker after data showed home sales in the country extended a plunge amid a widening mortgage boycott, with China Evergrande Group failing to unveil a long-promised restructuring framework on time. Investor confidence also weakened on news of a plan mauled by authorities to seize distressed developers' idle land to help complete stalled projects, a move that could cost creditors access to some of the builders' most valuable assets. And staying in the region, South Korea's factory output shrank in July for the first time in nearly two years as outputs and new orders weakened amid continued inflation and supply chain woes. The S&P Global Purchasing Managers Index fell to a seasonally adjusted 49.8 in July from 51.3 in June, falling below 50 for the first time since September 2020. The 50 mark separates expansion from contraction in factory activity from a previous month. Rishi Sunak, who is trailing in the race to become Britain's next prime minister, has vowed to slash the basic rate of income tax by 20% by 2029 in a potentially make or break throw of the dice by the former finance minister. Sanuk, once seen as the favorite to replace Boris Johnson when he helped to steer the economy through the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, has struggled against his rival, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss. Sunuk said he remained focused on tackling inflation, but once that was achieved, he would follow through on an already announced plan to take one pence off income tax in 2024 and then take a further three pence off by the end of the next parliament, likely around 2029. Crude oil fell as the week's trading kicked off after poor Chinese economic data added to concerns that a global slowdown may sap demand. WTI dropped towards $97 a barrel after sinking almost 7% in July in the first back-to-back -back monthly loss since late 2020. Weekend data indicated a surprise contraction in Chinese factory activity highlighting the cost of Beijing's preference for mobility curbs to tackle COVID-19. Oil has seen volatile trading in recent months as concerns about a slowdown hurt demand for commodities, even as underlying signals pointed to still tight fiscal and physical conditions. Gold fell after posting its biggest weekly gain since March as the market waited for fresh indicators on the state of the global economy and the pace of U.S. interest rate hikes. It rose 2.2% last week on speculation that the Federal Reserve will reduce the pace of rate increases as the U.S. economy slows. Still, it ended July down for a fourth consecutive month as it continued to lose out to the dollar as a safe haven option. U.S. employment data will be in focus this week with jobless claims for July coming on Thursday and non-farm payrolls a day later. And from the international headlines, after this quick timeout, we'll be narrowing things down to consumers in Africa's most industrialized economy and how they're feeling the pinch of rising inflation. Do stay with us. Could South Africa experience a repeat of the social violence that rocked parts of the country in July of last year? The answer to that depends on who you ask. But one thing many analysts agree on is that current economic conditions seem worse now than at the time of the riots. The employment losses caused by COVID-19 have not yet been made up for, despite formal non-farm jobs registered in Q1 2022 being 4.8% greater than those seen during Level 5 lockdown in Q2 2020. According to the most recent Stats SA quarterly employment survey for the country, the number of formal non-farm jobs increased by 42,000 in the first quarter of 2022 compared to the prior three months. And in 2022, nominal take-home income has remained constant while real take-home pay has sharply decreased. Joining me from Cape Town, South Africa, is Senior Manager and Senior Economist for PwC South Africa, Christy Felgin. Christy, welcome again to Business Edge. Thank you for joining me. Good afternoon. So Statistics SA data shows that formal employment increased by 2% year on year in the first quarter of 2022, but total jobs are still at pre-pandemic levels. 
So what does this mean for the economy, particularly in terms of the people who are earning an income and even contributing? Yes, so as a country, we, we lost about 2 million jobs in the, the depth of COVID-19. Uh, we got some of those back, but for more than a million of those jobs, we haven't recovered yet. Uh, even before the pandemic, we had the highest unemployment rate in the world and also the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. And that has continued to climb. Uh, it's the kind of record numbers that you don't want to see. Uh, for South African households, it's certainly bad news. Uh, as a country with struggles with poverty and inequality, uh, this pressure from a continued weak growth in employment, something we've seen for many, many years, it continues to pressure household finances. Many South African households are in a debt situation where they are unable to pay their debt every month. Uh, it leads to pressure on uh, social fabric, the, the stability of communities. It's a significant challenge even before we consider the problems at the moment of very high inflation and rising interest rates. So without uh, trying to find any a good point, all of these elements are quite negative. It shows us that at the moment, South African households are under significant financial pressure. And that's because South Africa is such a consumer driven economy. And so with households being under pressure, of course, there's a knockback or knockdown effect for the economy. But let's really look at the consumer in adjusting to the pressures that they're feeling now. What's the behavior of the South African consumer? What are they doing to make those adjustments? How have households uh, tried to find their way around the current economic situation? So obviously the biggest price increase that we've seen of late is in energy and food. And we say energy, it's a significant increase in fuel prices. Uh, fuel prices are up about 40% compared to a year ago. Fuel price inflation has jumped significantly since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And alongside that, we've seen food prices go up. And the, the big challenge for South African households already struggling with poverty, with with employment issues with low income, then you have to start making choices. You have to decide where do you cut back on essentials. And as we see globally, it's the concern about food security. It's concern about nutrition, where even if food is available, it's very expensive. And households need to make decisions on how often they can eat and what they can eat, how nutritious that is. So it's not only a question of finances and economics, but down to education also that needs to be prioritized. It's about health care. It's about the, just the ability to have the essentials in your house. And it's getting very expensive to do so. So the big concern is that at the moment in the winter where it's cold and many places in the country where it's wet, people do not have adequate money to keep the houses warm, to eat nutritional food, to buy clothing to keep them warm. And that's a problem that's going to be around for quite some time. We think that inflation and these elevator prices on food and energy will be with us for quite a few months still. So it is a concern that this could lead us into 2023 with significant economic challenges. So we saw CPI accelerate from 6.5% in May to 7.4% both year on year in June. And this is the highest reading since the middle of 2009. But we also have seen South Africa come out of a recession because of COVID-19. You're also facing the same global um, headwinds of the Russia-Ukraine crisis that all of us across the world, uh, continent are facing. So are all the drivers of the rise in inflation right now in South Africa tied solely to the global situation, external um, situations and things beyond the country's control? No, it's not just the international factors. Uh, we're all well aware of the global impacts from high energy and food prices. Uh, we know it's a, a tricky global situation in terms of supply chains, but locally we've had some, some key issues as well. Now, one of them was during April and May, we saw significant flooding in the KwaZulu-Natal province on the East Coast. And that's also home to the port of Durban, which is our biggest harbor. It is our biggest export and import harbor. And that's where many of our goods come in and out of the country. So that adds to the international supply chain problems. We also have had in this year so far increased electricity load shedding. So the government would at certain points where there is a shortage of electricity, the power utility ESCOM would have to implement rolling blackouts where certain areas have electricity and others don't. That obviously has a negative impact on business activity. Uh, we've seen very high levels at certain times of this load shedding where companies would be without electricity for four or six or even more hours a day. And even when you can have alternative sources, it gets very expensive to run a business at that cost. 
So that's the, another big problem for us at the moment. It's that knock-on effect of more expensive and unreliable electricity, which is hitting on the cost of production, the cost of import, the cost of supplying goods to ordinary South Africans. So that's definitely one of the big local factors that's also adding to this inflation challenge. So let's look to, um, at a response to some of this inflation. We've seen the South African Reserve Bank's uh, MPC committee uh, announce an increase of the repo rate of 75 basis points to 5.50%. And some have anticipated about 50, uh, 50 points increase. So this was actually above the forecast. And it's the fifth consecutive MPC meeting where policymakers are lifting lending rates. How does this tie into some of the pressures that we're seeing on South African households right now? Why so much higher than, ex uh, than even expected? So the, the context for the interest rate is in 2020, our Reserve Bank cut interest rates to the lowest in about 50 years because of the, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and then last year in 2021, they they messaged often that interest rates will need to start going up again with the aim of getting them back to where they were before COVID-19. So we've known for quite some time that interest rates will be going up. And the normal adjustment for quite a few years was just at 25 basis points uh, upwards or downwards. And we saw this in November last year and quite a few times this year as well. And then in, in, in May, there was the unexpected 50 basis points. Now, that was mostly because the Reserve Bank was reacting to very high inflation numbers falling outside of their target range. And then in July, most expectations, again, 50 basis points with a few economists thinking maybe 75. The Reserve Bank adjusted the repo rate by 75 basis points with the intention of sending a signal to the economy that it is serious on inflation. Um, as an inflation targeting central bank, its mandate is to keep inflation under control. Uh, and that's the message they're sending. They're saying that we've taken this big step now. We've brought forward probably some of the interest rate increases we would have seen over the next 12 to 18 months and sending the signal that we are serious on inflation. So interest rates are going to continue rising. That's, that's no doubt. Uh, it, it's just a question of how quickly we see this happen. And the Reserve Bank always says it's data dependent. So if inflation numbers remain high and higher than expected, they can probably continue with higher than usual interest rate adjustments in the near future. So we've seen the U.S. dollar have this major surge against major uh, currencies around the world in recent times. Now it's up 15% against the British pound, 16% against the euro, and 23% against the Chinese, uh, the Japanese yen, I beg your pardon. So in terms of these high dollar rates right now, how is that affecting the RAND and therefore affecting South Africa's economy? So the RAND actually did quite well in the first quarter of this year. Even after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, unexpectedly, the RAND did quite well. And then in the second quarter, we saw that the dollar was gaining strength and it was doing very well against most currencies in the world. And when the dollar does well, emerging market currencies like the RAND, they generally don't do well. So the RAND is certainly on a weaker foot at the moment. Um, many analysts would tell us that it's undervalued. It needs to be a bit stronger. But in a, in a disrupted world with so much uncertainty that we live in, the RAND is usually under pressure when these things happen. And when that is a problem, where that is a problem is when we import goods. South Africa imports almost all of our fuel needs. We import a significant volume of food products. Uh, many of our own commodity prices also follow international prices. So all of this means that when we import something priced in dollar or euro, it, it, it gets more expensive. So that's now for the, the average South African. The biggest impact of this weak rand is the pressure on products. And we see it with the monthly adjustments in the fuel price, which have gone up significantly. We see it stepwise coming in at the cost of just the regular food and household products when you go to a retail outlet. So for me, the where there's often most South Africans don't think too much about what the RAND is doing. Right now, this weak RAND is exacerbating this inflation situation, adding more pressure from the import side on the cost of regular goods, normal and essential goods that most South Africans need to shop for. So, Christy, as we wrap things up, the question has to be, is there a solution or is there some type right. of fail, not a fail safe, but something that can cushion South Africans from this. So there's the external global situation, there's the internal situation that South Africa has as well. Are there any policies in play or that should be in play to help cushion the effects that South Africans are feeling? 
Well, there's, there's the short-term ideas and there's long-term ideas. And in the short term, what our government did was they, for the past four months, they've given us a bit of a tax break on fuel prices, which has put back about 14 billion rand into the economy. Uh, that's about $1 billion if I do that conversion. Uh, that's the quickest way of, of assisting the regular person, the, the households, small businesses in covering their costs. But it's not sustainable. Uh, you don't want to introduce subsidies or tax breaks that continue indefinitely. And our government has rolled that back. As of Wednesday, those tax breaks will come to an end. The long-term solution is to reduce your, ex your, your dependent on imported goods. And that basically means that you need to produce more locally. You need to be able to create more jobs locally by creating and manufacturing goods and services that you use that you're not dependent on importing. If we think again of the fuel situation, which is obviously a very complex and a big investment type discussion, if we can make more fuels locally, automotive fuels, households, fuels, et cetera, then we are less dependent on imports where we at the moment, we can clearly see where that vulnerability is from a price perspective. So I would say in general, domestic economic development, uh, value addition, creating more opportunities locally for, for manufacturing. Those are some of the points that we can look at to reduce dependence on imported items. All right, Christy, thank you so much for your time. As usual, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. And from conversations that span the global economy to Nigeria and South Africa, and probably around the continent, the idea is that Africa must produce more locally and must trade locally so as to not be at the mercy of global economic headwinds that we're feeling now. You're watching Business Edge. We'll be wrapping things up. But before we do that, it's NC4 to watch. Stick around. And these are a few stories we're keeping track of. We start in Northern Africa, where the volume of Egyptian agricultural exports reached around 4.191 million tons during the period from January 1st until June 27th. The chairman of the Food Export Council, Hani Barzi, said that Egypt's exports of food industries grew by around 5% year-on-year, or $49 million, during the first quarter of 2022. In South Africa, black ownership of enterprises fell by 1.5 percentage points to so under 30 percent last year as the country battles to economically uplift a bigger segment of its populace. According to the BBBEE Commission, black management control also decreased 5.4 percentage points to 51.6 percent. The broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act, passed almost two decades ago to remedy imbalances due to apartheid, where four out of five people in South Africa are black, is the commission's mandate. Zambia's creditors pledged to negotiate a restructuring of the country's debt, a move the IMF managing director welcomed as clearing the way for a $1.4 billion fund program. The creditor committee, co-chaired by China and France, said that it supports Zambia's envisaged MIF upper credit tranche program and its swift adoption by the IMF executive board. And finally, a Central Bank of Nigeria official has clarified that the CBN did not direct deposit money banks to seize funds in community associations' savings accounts. The official clarified that the Apex Bank only asked associations and the likes to regularize their accounts in accordance with Kama provisions and nothing more. And that's the business we have for you today on Business Edge. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can also download our mobile app and subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch us on the platforms we are available. And we're very proud here at New Central to say that you can watch us put Africa first every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right now on DSTV channel 422. Africa, we're live. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Rubalogo. Have a fantastic day.